Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here today. My name is Eyal Weiss. I'm a PhD student at Barilan University, working under uh, the supervision of uh, Professor Gal Kaminka. And my uh, PhD research is about a uh, graph search uh, theory and algorithms for planning uh, with dynamically estimated action models. Thank you for the microphone. Um, so I guess most of you, or maybe um, almost all of you, uh, don't know the field of automated planning, which is a subfield of artificial intelligence. So the, um, uh, the idea, the, the general idea behind the field is to um, enable uh, agents of various sorts, uh, be it uh, physical or virtual, uh, to have planning capabilities uh, so, they, they, so that they can use action models, models of the reality, uh, and form up with uh, action plans, which can then they execute later. Okay, so um, for the sake of this environment, it, of, of this talk, I think we can just focus on graph search. Uh, and whenever I say planner, you can just uh, imagine uh, the graph search algorithm. Okay. Um, okay, so first, um, just a, a brief outline. So I'm going to first explain what is, uh, what do I mean by dynamically computed action models, which is a, a new, uh, let's say, a paradigm in a discrete computation. Um, and then I'm going to uh, basically uh, talk to you about the, the key idea uh, uh, in our mathematical framework, which is novel. Uh, and, the, and the basic idea is that instead of using uh, fixed, no numeric values uh, for, let's say, shortest path problems in graphs, uh, we allow uh, gradually improving um, uh, estimations of uh, these numeric values uh, at the cost of computational expense, okay? Uh, which can be uh, executed during search time of the algorithm, okay, by the algorithm. This is the main novelty, and I'm going to discuss more about it later. Um, specifically, uh, in this talk, I'm going to just uh, focus uh, on uh, action costs or in graph search, uh, edge weights, okay? Uh, but this, but this uh, do apply to several other uh, categories of uh, numeric uh, values. Um, then I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the uh, algorithm we've developed, which is a generalization of A-star. A-star is the most famous uh, search graph search algorithm. Um, so uh, we've generalized it, and uh, I come up with an algorithm called ACE, and uh, I'm just I'll briefly uh, show that uh, ACE is indeed highly effective. Um, okay, so what do I mean by dynamically estimated uh, action models? And why do we use them? Uh, how? Um, so um, basically, uh, planning relies on models, okay? Uh, so there are various uh, models of um, modeling part of the reality. Uh, and the basic assumption is that we know them prior uh, to uh, when we start solving the problem, okay? We assume that we have uh, modeling, modeling process, then the model is fixed, and then we use it to solve the problem. Okay, this is common in many fields. Uh, but it induces some problems, okay? Uh, and the major uh, problem uh, we tackle here is that some of the modeling parts can take a lot of time to compute, okay? And if we, um, and if we adhere to this computation uh, uh, fully prior to solving the problem, we introduce um, we potentially introduce a major overhead, a major computational overhead uh, on the problem, okay? Because the state spaces uh, we deal with are very large, okay? Um, so, um, and in reality, uh, indeed, many parts of the model take long to compute, uh, but furthermore, we also have, um, many times we have alternative, okay? We have alternatives that are uh, cheaper estimates, which give a rough approximation, maybe a better approximation, uh, but they take a shorter time to compute, okay? And we want to uh, leverage this um, in order to uh, develop a more robust framework, more robust and uh, potentially uh, with less computational overhead, okay? And okay, so uh, this, is, this is quite general and then numeric attributes uh, in this case can be costs, probabilities, time durations. But again, in this talk, I'm just focusing on uh, action costs, which is uh, similar to edge weights. Okay, um, so our main insight is that we should, uh, we should uh, postpone some of the computation, okay, the edge weight uh, estimation part, 
uh, to the search process and let the planner choose which estimators to invoke, okay? And this, uh, and this makes sense because um, if we do it ad hoc, then it allows us to save unnecessary computation and then also deal with larger problems, okay? That we cannot deal if we do all the computation in advance. Um, okay, so again, the focus is on uh, action cost estimators. Um, so um, costs can be obtained by uh, external procedures, okay? And again, they can consume non-negligible runtime and, uh, and almost always uh, um, estimators of various numerical properties, I guess you all know that, return with some uncertainty, right? We try to quantify it using statistical measures, let's say standard deviation, confidence, uh, bounds, uh, whatever. Um, this is trivial, but, but the, actually, the common assumption in combinatorial optimization problems is that we do have fixed exact values, okay? Uh, in some cases, there are, of course, uh, fields that try to take into account uncertainty uh, via assumptions on uh, distributions of values or uh, maybe some uh, unknown interval and then uh, do uh, apply other uh, methods of uh, uh, robust optimization. This is, this, uh, our approach uh, um, is basically an alternative, okay? An alternative one that gives uh, more options. Um, okay, so some, some examples for external procedures. Uh, so let's say in the robotics domain, if we want uh, our robotic agent to plan uh, motion in 3D space, then it has to uh, resort to some, uh, uh, some specialized models uh, that, that are called motion planners. Okay, these, these are um, planners that uh, take into consideration geometric constraints in space and uh, try to come up with a feasible path. Uh, and they can uh, check validity of that, but they, but they can also give uh, numeric values uh, that uh, quantify, let's say, the, en the amount of energy ne necessary to travel this in space or the amount of time or uh, different metrics. Uh, so this is in the robotics domain, but we can actually think about any, any domain. And uh, of course, you all know uh, neural networks, I guess uh, many of you use, uh, use uh, learning approaches to uh, estimate uh, estimate and quantify numeric values, and uh, they all come up with uncertainty, okay, that we want to quantify and use it. Um, so basically it applies to every domain, okay? Um, I'll skip the next example. Um, okay, and again, our, our model assumes that, um, which is a quite a, a quite reasonable assumption, that if we allow more time, then we can obtain results that are better, okay? This is, of course, uh, bounded by the methods we have, but usually, um, if we can uh, allow more processing time to uh, take into account more data, then, um, and then we can indeed um, at least reduce uh, the standard deviations up to some point. Okay. Um, so um, this uh, new formalization, this new mathematical formalization, um, it introduces um, another degree of freedom that we have to manage. Okay, so new algorithms are required. Um, and um, so typically, uh, so typically, let's say uh, in uh, standard combinatorial optimization problems that take into account numeric uh, values, we have let's say get cost. So now instead of the get cost, we have get estimate, and the get estimate instead, uh, um, um, instead of returning just an exact value, it returns an interval. Oh, sorry, an interval. Okay, like a low and upper bound that that uh, contain the, the true value, and we work with these bounds. Um, so um, the, the major insight here is that uh, this uh, uh, novel formulation introduces um, another, uh, another degree of freedom that we have to take into consideration. Okay, so in standard uh, combinatorial optimization problems of various sorts, specifically in shortest path problems, uh, we try to minimize the search effort. Okay, and we have various ways to do so, but we focus on the search effort, the number of uh, 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 atomic actions that we have to use in order to uh, uh, come up with the shortest path, okay? But now we also have another kind of effort, which is estimation effort, okay? And we have to manage because there's a trade-off between them. We can easily come up with algorithms that minimize search effort, but uh, um, do it on the expense of estimation effort and vice versa, okay? Um, so, um, 
Um, let me just, you know what, briefly describe the mathematical setup. So let's say uh, we have a, an edge E. So for each edge E, we can have uh, an ordered set of estimators, um, uh, theta EI, uh, where we assume that uh, as I increases, it takes longer to compute, but uh, we have uh, smaller intervals, okay? And, and uh, look, look at the uh, intervals here. We can see that uh, if j is greater than i, then the interval of j is uh, contained in the interval of i. Okay, so we get uh, um, a better accuracy as we apply more uh, estimators. Um, and the target uh, in this case is to obtain uh, a shortest path, which is uh, which has bounded suboptimality. Okay, so um, so let's say that C star is the uh, exact, possibly unknown uh, um, cost of the shortest path. Then we want to obtain a path. Uh, that has cost that is bounded by the optimal cost uh, times some suboptimality factor. And of course, if we take this suboptimality uh, sub factor B to one, then we want to uh, find the shortest path. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll move on f fast on the uh, results because I guess we don't have a lot of time. Um, but uh, I just want to give you the, the insight b behind our algorithm ACE. So it, it uses the a, a typical structure of A star, uh, which uh, usually monitors just the, the accumulated cost of the path, but now we introduce uh, two, uh, two queues, one that uh, monitors the, uh, the um, updated lower bound and updated upper bound of each path, okay? And then during, uh, during the uh, run of the algorithm, um, we uh, check, we compute uh, the, uh, um, effective uh, um, uncertainty ratio, this is eta here, uh, obtained by the uh, division of the uh, sum of upper bounds by the sum of lower bounds. And whenever it is greater than what we wish to achieve, we apply more estimations, okay? So this is just, this is just one approach to tackle this problem. There are many approaches, but uh, we show in experiments that this is highly effective. Um, I won't go into details, but for those of you who know the, the structure of the algorithm, it's quite similar uh, to A star, except the, what is bounded in the box. Um, so some theoretical properties, our algorithm is correct. It, it is guaranteed to uh, find solutions if they exist, but it is not guaranteed to find optimal solutions. And this is in contrary to A star, because in this case, we have um, another property that we've uh, um, studied uh, and that uh, Basically, uh, if, if I basically describe, describe it, it has to, uh, the estimators given to us have to satisfy um, um, some uh, goodness, uh, uh, fitness uh, measure, okay? If they are not good enough, then we won't be able to achieve uh, the desired accuracy that we want to achieve. Um, I'll just, you know, I'll just uh, say uh, briefly um, in one slide about the experiment that the, um, our algorithm compared uh, to uh, the baseline, uh, achieves the same search effort, okay? Remember that I said we have two dimensions, search effort and uh, estimation effort. So it, it achieves exactly the same search effort, but it reduces the estimation effort by a lot. Uh, the, our, our curves um, are depicted here and the baseline is, is one. And what we see on the curves is the ratio of uh, the, uh, roughly speaking, the amount of estimation effort our algorithm utilized relative to the baseline. So we have uh, savings between 50% to almost 100% in some uh, sparsity scenarios. And I'll be happy to uh, explain more uh, later on if any of you are interested. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll skip this and I'll just uh, uh, conclude that um, um, online estimation of costs or edge weights or other numeric parameters um, allows, sorry, uh, it allows uh, to uh, tackle um, larger scale problems because it enables us to reduce unnecessary computation. And furthermore, uh, it builds on uh, known uncertainty bounds um, in order to provide ro uh, robustness measures to our output um, paths, okay? Or output solutions uh, for what, whatever um, optimization problem we have. Um, we've formalized a new mathematical framework. We develop algorithms that show their efficiency. And uh, next on, uh, we're working on several um, parallel directions for uh, better algorithms, more um, other numeric parameters such as uh, probabilities. And actually, we've also started to generalize this framework to 
uh, totally other um, um, discrete optimization problems such as sorting um, weighted um, uh, weighted the spanning tree um, and actually many many other uh, paths and I'll be happy to uh, talk about it uh, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the question is that somebody is totally out of the field. Yeah. How much time and effort hours does it take? Did it take you to go from A star to A? And is A final or you're still improving it? Okay, great. That, that's a great question. It it actually uh, it, it, it's totally dependent on the problems we have uh, on. The, the scale of the search effort, but but also on domain where the motion planners can take uh, somewhere between uh, dozens or hundreds of milliseconds to seconds, then then uh, moving from uh, A star to ACE, um, you go from um, under a second to uh, to maybe minutes, uh, dozens of minutes uh, for, uh, for very hard problems, hours. And I'm talking about um, relatively small scale problems, not, not the uh, hard ones. Um, not hard, hard ones, I mean like climate uh, um, prediction or so on. Um, but again, it gives us actually the tools to address problems that weren't addressable before uh, because uh, uh, beforehand, um, we had to uh, adhere to uh, some estimation level effort and assume this is the case and then work with it. And now we can um, scale with the problem. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll take you in a completely different direction. Um, I can't say I don't have anything computational in my research. I do, but unfortunately, I didn't do it myself. So don't ask too difficult questions about it. Um, I'm going to tell you today about how we use block polymers and how we grow uh, metal oxides inside of these polymers towards uh, nanofabrication processes. Uh, so block polymers are wonderful materials. They tend to self-assemble into a variety of structures uh, based on their chemistry, their size, uh, a lot of qualities that we can control uh, in the nanometric scale. Uh, so we'd like to use them in order to form uh, nanofabrication processes, but to do that, we have to be able to better control their properties. So chemical properties, electrical properties, mechanical properties. Um, the way that we suggest to do this is a novel method that is based on ALD chemistry uh, that allows us to grow the metal oxide selectively inside one of the domains of the polymer okay, uh, from the gas phase. So we have here a block of polymer film. We expose it to one organometallic precursor that diffuses into the film and binds only to one of the uh, blocks. We then expose it to a second precursor and in that way, we can grow an inorganic structure that is templated by the block polymer in a bottom-up approach. Uh, so there have been a lot of examples about doing this in the um, scientific community. It's been shown to work for ultrafiltration membranes, um, using lithography. It's been shown for conductive nanowires and also as a way to control low refractive index surfaces. Uh, but there are a lot more applications that I'm not showing here today. Uh, so what we wanted to do is really understand how SIS works and then take it and use it to better tailor our processes. Um, so SIS is based on uh, three steps. First, we have sorption of the molecule into the polymer. It then diffuses into and binds with one of the um, functional groups of the polymer in a coordinative reaction. Right, the, the process is governed by two things, so the thermodynamics of the process of the reaction and the dynamics, so how it diffuses into it. And today I'm going to talk about both, um, starting with the thermodynamics. So this is a lot of chemistry, I won't go into it too deeply, but basically we have here um, a reversible reaction between our polymer and our precursor. We've taken here two uh, types of polymers. 
Um, and we have a constant that describes the reaction rate between these, uh, which is equal to the rate of the forward reaction, so binding, attaching, and the reverse reaction of detaching. Um, and this constant is uh, correlated to the delta G uh, Gibbs free energy of the reaction. Um, so using density functional theory, which is the part that I did not do myself, this is a collaboration with um, Dr. Alex Koshansky from um, our chemistry department. Um, we've calculated delta G for these two polymer systems. And what we could see is that delta G equals zero for these two polymers at two different temperatures. Uh, but what does that mean in case, in, in sense of mass gain? So in order to uh, probe the mass gain, we've done in situ uh, quartz crystal microbalance measurements that allowed us to measure the mass in the film as the process progresses. And what we saw is that we get maximal mass gain at temperatures that are very, very similar to the temperatures where delta G equals zero. Um, and we wanted to understand why that happens. What we uh, described here is really two regions of temperature. So we have the low temperature region where delta G is smaller than zero and um, the forward reaction of attaching is stronger than the one of detaching. So the, um, the precursor binds strongly at the top of the film and creates a layer that prevents further diffusion into the film. On the other hand, in the high temperature region, we have very, very good diffusion, uh, but very few molecules actually bind to the film. So once again, mass gain is low. Only at uh, the point that we named balance point temperature, we have a balance between the uh, diffusion into the film and the reaction. Um, so we wanted to test this model. How can we see that what we are describing is actually what happens? And we designed a temperature uh, changing experiment where we change the temperature as the experiment uh, uh, goes. So we started out at, um, sorry, we started out at 95 degrees, which is far below the balance point temperature for this polymer. And we could see that we have here growth that is very similar to what we would expect in this temperature. We then heated up our experiment to 150 degrees, which is much closer to the balance point. And what we expect to happen if our theory is correct is that the molecules will then diffuse deeper into the film after detaching and uh, rebind inside it. And really what we saw is that mass grew to be almost three times higher than what it was at the beginning, um, very close to the value that uh, we saw when we did the entire experiment at 150 degrees. Um, so the next step for us was to take this understanding and find uh, a way to apply it to block of polymers. Uh, we chose a block of polymer that self-assembly is very temperature sensitive. So if I exposed it to 150 degrees, the self-assembly would be destroyed. Um, and we tried growing in it at 80 degrees. So what we could see is that the self-assembly pattern has uh, been preserved, but we got a very, very thin film uh, as a result. When we did the same experiment at 150 degrees, uh, we got a very thick layer, but no self-assembly. Um, so we designed an experiment where we do the first cycle of SIS at 80 degrees, and then the following cycles at 150 degrees. Um, so we know that our precursor is able to diffuse through the other block without reacting to it. So hypothetically speaking, our layer would have the shape of the block that we're growing in, even if it doesn't go in. Um, in which case, it would prevent it from changing its uh, assembly at a higher temperature. And really what we saw is that we were able to preserve the morphology of the polymer, but got a much thicker layer, similar to what we saw at 150 degrees. Um, and uh, taking this one step further, we wanted to experiment with different precursors. So this is taking us into, no, sorry, skipped one. Um, before that, uh, we wanted to probe the dynamics of the process. So if we look at the full process we have here, uh, mass going up uh, after um, we expose our precursor into the cell. So we have an increase in pressure here in black. 
And then we have increase in mass in a delayed response to the pressure that goes down and eventually stabilizes. Um, but we wanted to see what happens if we stop our experiment here while we're still in the high mass region. And really what we saw is that if we only should do a short exposure of just one cycle, we can uh, grow 60 nanometers of alumina, which just to compare is what you would grow with five whole cycles of SIS otherwise in just one cycle. So now we'll take this uh, to two precursors. Um, so we introduced a second precursor. This is a precursor to grow zinc oxide. Um, and what we did is we did a very, very short exposure to the first alumina precursor, only allowing it to infiltrate the top of the film and um, catch all of the sites that are there. We then exposed it to the second precursor, but all of the active sites at the top are already occupied, so it has no choice but to go deeper into the film and bind at the bottom. Uh, we then exposed it to water and finally etched away the polymer. Uh, so what we saw is that we get two separate um, regions inside of our cylinders uh, and that we can control the ratio between these two precursors by controlling the um, amount of time we allow the first precursor to diffuse. Uh, and with increasing TMA exposure, we got more and more alumina in our cylinders. We also characterize this system using, um, sorry, TEM tomography. So you can see here the tilt series, we are um, exposing our sample to the beam at different angles, and then we uh, reconstruct it to get a 3D, um, a 3D uh, model of our system. Um, and simultaneously with this, we also did elemental mapping in the TEM, and these were reconstructed together. And you can see here in this video, uh, the reconstructed data that shows based on elemental mapping how our, um, how our elements are really separated. Um, so from what I've shown you, uh, we've seen how understanding the dynamics and thermodynamics of SAS has allowed us to harness its uh, great potential in order to control two different uh, pathways in the system. And uh, with that, I'll conclude. Uh, this is everyone who's been involved in these uh, two projects, and thank you for listening. Um, so maybe I didn't get it quite, but what is exactly the mechanism that controls the pattern formation of these block of polymers in, in this sort of lattice? Um, so thing. block of polymers, the way you can imagine them, you have one chain that is one of the blocks and a second chain that is the other. So if I control the length of each of these um, chains, I can control the pattern. If one is really, really short, it would form um, uh, particles. If uh, they are around 30, 70, I get these cylinders that you saw. If you go closer to 50, 50, then you would get lamella. And there are more complex morphologies that you can achieve if you have more than one block, uh, more than two blocks, and uh, so on. Um, but what you control here is really the chemistry of the polymer, and the self-assembly is dictated by that. So the polymer does the assembly on its own. Uh, we just supply the surrounding conditions, which is what makes this uh, such a powerful system, because it's not dependent um, so much on what we do. It's the equilibrium state of the system, right? Mostly, yes. Uh, for example, in the one I've shown uh, growing two different temperatures, it's not the equilibrium state. It is uh, thermo thermodynamically trapped. Um, so that's the reason that at 150, the self-assembly would be ruined, because it would go to the thermodynamically stable state. What do you mean by trapped? Is there like an energy barrier? That um, no, cause? it's usually done uh, with solvent. So you supply the correct conditions for it to assemble this way, and then you quench it. So it doesn't have enough time to change. So it's like a glass sort of thing? Yes. Okay. A glass transition thing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, two short questions. One, uh, can you form like single crystalline 
uh, materials with this uh, method or is everything disordered? And the second, are you limited in uh, the growing geometry that you can have? Not just the lateral geometry. Yeah, so the first question, um, TMA, uh, so alumina grown in these temperatures is um, amorphous. Uh, if you want it to be crystalline, you have to do frost processes to uh, make that happen. Um, the zinc oxide, uh, which is what we're doing in uh, my current research, which I haven't shown, um, is crystalline, but it is polycrystalline. So once again, if you want to have directionality, you have to introduce it at a later step, but it is done. Um, and the second question, sorry. So, uh, so you've shown that you can do like uh, uh, diffusion of uh, certain elements yeah, to certain so ranges, so you can control right. the geometry uh, this way. So it is, it is um, hindered by geometry, which is some of the problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, so if you have a very large particle, how can you make sure that you reach all the way inside, things like that. Um, so understanding the process helps with that. For example, if you know you need the diffusion to be the major step, then you start at a higher temperature and then you can reduce it, uh, things like that. Um, and it's a really powerful tool that we got from this research uh, to be able to understand that and apply it to other research. The next talk is by Yoav Zigdong, uh, Physics, Ben Gurion University. Um, okay, yeah. thanks for the organizers for this nice event. Um, I will talk about black holes and um, typical states in string theory. Um, uh, by now, there has been strong e observational evidence for the existence of black holes in the universe in which we live. Uh, you can see in this figure uh, a snapshot of stars that orbit around a compact object in the center of the galaxy. Um, and they orbit around a relatively compact object um, uh, for which the explanation that is usually given is the general relativistic black hole. Um, in Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, black holes are defined as objects that do not allow matter and light to exit it uh, because of a strong gravitational force inwards. Um, um, on top of this, sorry, uh, most of the black hole interior in general relativity is empty. It's in the vacuum state. Uh, and there is a singularity at the center of the black hole where the energy density is localized. So it's really a defining interior inside the event. Yes, that's right. Um, um, however, this general relativistic description suffers from uh, at least two theoretical problems. Um, one of them is uh, shown by Hawking that uh, black holes emit thermal radiation. And the process of evolution of this, uh, of some star that collapses to a black hole and then emits this radiation uh, was shown to violate a rule of quantum mechanics. Uh, and this is bad because in conventional systems uh, in the lab, we see that uh, quantum mechanics is a correct theory. Um, so this is one issue, which I can elaborate on this. Uh, if, if you'll ask me about. Uh, the second issue which I mentioned is the existence of the singularity at the center of the black hole, uh, which involves infinitely large density. And usually in physics, we want theories that predict finite results for experiments. Uh, so this is another indication that something is amiss in the general relativistic description of black holes. And uh, this motivates a better des description of this uh, object. Um, and um, string theory is a theory that combines general relativity with quantum mechanics. And it has the potential of resolving the issues that I mentioned. Um, it posits that the fundamental constituents of energy in nature are extended objects like strings and brains. Uh, so on the left, there is a closed string 
on the right uh, two-dimensional brain. You could also have higher dimensional brains in the theory. Um, and these fundamental objects could be either uh, small or large and also one can bind together these objects on top of each other to form more complicated uh, states. And okay. Um, now I would like to come back to the black hole issue, which I mentioned. Uh, um, so in the last 20 years or so, people have been developing the so-called fuzzball uh, conjecture, which is the proposition that in string theory, the general relativistic uh, description, which consists, uh, which is characterized by the singularity, vacuum state, uh, and the lack of the possibility of objects to exit the black hole by another type of object, uh, which has the same mass, same charges, roughly the same size. Um, but as I mentioned, there are these uh, differences between the two descriptions. Mm -hmm. And briefly what I'm doing in uh, my research is, uh, um, so in collaboration with Professor Martinek from the University of Chicago, we're looking at typical states in uh, string theory of fundamental strings bound to five-dimensional brains. Um, and we consider the states to have uh, large energy and they can rotate in space. Um, and we calculate properties of these states, which in include uh, the size of these objects, uh, the geometry that they induce. So uh, already in general... Rel yes. I mean, I know we have, I know 26. Yeah. Is this five like the loser flying five or? So, so you have a 10 dimensional space and uh, within the space there, there is a five dimensional compact space and around this compact. Why, why specifically five? Um, because this objects wrap around the compact space and we look at a specific space which has a five dimensional compact space times five dimensional non-compact space. And but we expect that lessons drawn from this research are also applicable for say four dimensional uh, non-compact space. Um, and so um, I mentioned, um, let's see. Yeah, I wanted to say that already in general relativity, uh, it was understood that energies uh, sources induce uh, curvature in the geometry. And we want to study what is the geometry which, uh, I, I should say sp space-time geometry. Uh, and we want to study what is the space-time geometry that corresponds to this typical bound states. And, and finally, we also calculate uh, typical separation between parts of this uh, extended object. Uh, so that's more or less uh, what I do. And thanks for your attention. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Do I have questions? Yeah. Yes, let me go with you. So, yeah. Can you please explain to a non physicist um, why are we talking about five dimensional brains? So, uh, you know, the three dimensional, uh, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. So, is it just a mathematical construct that you want to study and then? Yes, it's, it's a mathematical construct uh, that allows to perform calculations, but we expect that even with this mathematical construct, uh, it, that lessons from it can be relevant also for the four-dimensional uh, space in which we live. But, yeah. um, so a follow-up question. Um, were four-dimensional space spaces researched before? This is this is why you went to five-dimensional, or we have different properties of symmetry, or yeah. so. So in, in the space, there is a five-dimensional compact object, five-dimensional compact, di five compact dimensions, and five non-compact dimensions, which in, also include time. Uh, this is in this setup, and this is for the the possibility of doing calculations. Yeah. Okay. I can, uh, we can further discuss this. Okay, if you're asking why not four dimensional, right? 
Yes, I wanted to know if... Uh, well, we, we haven't done yet uh, four dimensional, but... Uh, this is essentially computational attractability. Yes, that's right, that's right. Okay. It's yeah. possible to do it five now. Yes, that's not right. Not in four yet. Yeah. Great, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Yes. Barry? Um, so there was a point on your slides when you said that light could exit the fuzz ball. That's right. Um, so are but, there any... But, but it's still hard for it to escape it. Okay. So are there any observational uh, implications for... Um, uh, I mean, given the possibility that that light can actually come out? Yeah. Is there any possibility? possible chance to see something, maybe in like LIGO, um, I mean, combined with a LIGO observation. Well, you mean uh, light that exits it or gravitational uh, gravitons that exit it? Any, it? any information that exits what would have been a horizon, uh, um, anything we could actually see that will tell us what happens uh, in a cosmos. I don't know, but, but I heard people say that uh, it's not realistic that these fuzzballs would emit something that would be observed. Uh, you, you would still need these observations, uh, let's say stars orbiting around a compact object or the gravitational waves emission. Mm -hmm. uh, but we think, some people think that the emission of gravitational waves uh, would be different from between fuzzballs and conventional general relativistic black holes, and this could uh, uh, distinguish the two cases. Thank you. Okay. Uh, on that, uh, on that? Well, I think that Sorry? Uh, you find, uh, okay. We should also each other? Yeah. Just a quick question. Um, in, uh, in my PhD, I, I uh, also kind of uh, looked at problems that were similar, but for other systems, where where you go to a higher dimensionality, you suddenly have a certain vector field that reduces your singularity, something that was catastrophic in a lower dimensionality, to something that is more tolerable. Um, in, in that sense, are you looking at certain theories that have already been implemented uh, in, in this type of field? Or are you trying to kind of find a new theory? I'm not, I'm not trying to find a new theory. I'm applying the rules of string theory to the problem. So that's, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean string theory. I meant uh, basically you were describing, I'm going to say a dirty word, you were describing the topology of certain problems. And there is a way to kind of try and, and uh, uh, understand topology in different types of dimensions via like just, you know, the the rules of topology. So I, I'm interested to discuss this with you because the problems that you've shown kind of look similar to some that I've had to encounter. Uh, let's discuss this later. Any other questions? Yes. Thanks, Yoav. Um, so if I understand correctly, the state that you are trying to analyze is a many body state of many strings. Is that a true statement? N not really. It's uh, really one string which is bound to one five lane. Okay, uh, so just one string. But but uh, I'm looking at an ensemble of such bounce uh, states and average over this ensemble. So w what I'm alluding to is whether the black hole or fuzzball state is uh, a phase transition of something which is like a many body state. Because it, in this it, case, there could be a critical dimension uh, for which a phase transition would not occur anymore. And it, this could be four dimensions. So. You want phase transition between which phase to which phase? From a black hole, uh, from a black oh. hole-like entity, uh, the way you define it, to right. something which is more regular. Um, yeah, people uh, discuss this uh, phase transition. It's called the black hole string transition. Uh, but I didn't get your specific question. I mean, whether there's a critical dimension here that you are aware of that might be problematic uh, for you to um, deduce things from the 10 dimensional solution to a four dimensional one. Uh, because if the critical dimension is four, then that's a problem. But if it's not, then it's fine. If it's three, then it's fine. I, I don't think it's an issue, but uh, I'd like to talk about you with okay, sure. deal with this. Yeah. Thanks. Very good. Any questions? 
Good. Hi. So hi everyone. Um, to try today, I try. I will try to show you briefly, <coughs> and I'm trying to convince you about the concept of uh, fabricating a functional material. I'm going to show you different types of functional material using bottom-up approach, in which we can think about the building blocks of the desired material and how we synthesize them in the lab in a certain and specific way uh, with the specific properties. And later on, we can predict, okay, if I can take these building blocks like Lego, build them on top of each other in a methods that uh, we have now available in the laboratory, we can uh, really think about uh, the material that uh, we will end up in our end. Good, so um, there is a many types of materials that we, that, uh, uh, we showed, uh, uh, I showed in my uh, PhD. Uh, we, try, we managed to store charge. Uh, we showed uh, a memory element. We showed also that we can also uh, monitor and control over the potential we applied in order to operate materials and, uh, and electronics. Um, but as I, show, as I explained to you, the bottom-up approach, uh, we're starting with the building blocks. Um, then we need to think carefully how they will bind to each other and will bind to a functional surface. And later on, we get the desired material. So the building blocks could be organic molecules. They can be nanoparticles, polymers, uh, many others, nano uh, species you can think of uh, that can use as a building blocks. Later on, we need to think what would be, again, the binding in between these building blocks. Uh, that is uh, very important because they will later on control over the mechanical properties of your system. And later on, we will end up with, uh, with, the, uh, with the, fun the functionality, the desired functionality uh, you think of, like solar cells, energy storage, smart materials, sensor, etc., etc., etc. So the composition of these, bu these building blocks, you can use only one type of building blocks, two types of building blocks. The way that you attach them on surface and attach them to each other is also very important to the desired the performance of the material. So this is also something we need to take into account. So luckily we are chemists. We can make molecules uh, from, from the atomic resolution. We can think about the properties we would like to achieve from our building blocks. So this is the molecules we synthesize in our laboratory. This is a complex with transition metal on the center, surrounding by bipyridine ligands. Um, and the uniqueness of this complex is that, okay, we can change the metal, the identity of the transition metal. In the end, we get a very naive uh, properties color, okay? Different colors uh, that as uh, by different uh, uh, transition metal. Um, I will not elaborate it today, but uh, they have a very extension coefficient. Um, and also they have a different electronic properties. So what we have in hand, it's like a Lego, uh, in which we have four different building blocks, four different metal centers. Each of them poses a different electronic properties. So how we can uh, deposit them on top of the surface, um, very uh, easy method called spin coating, which we first of all use a stick, a linker, palladium, uh, that will help us to later on bind the uh, building blocks to also to the surface. So first of all, we are, we are drop casting the palladium, then the complex, then we're washing with acetone, drying with air. You can repeat it as many as you want. Uh, as you have more repetition, of course, the thickness of your uh, materials will be greater and greater. So this is uh, how today I will show you um, uh, uh, I will present you the materials. We have conductive support. We have the molecules like a, like a molecular assembly on top of each other. And this is the way I will present it to you, like a block. It will help, you, it will help all of us to understand it more uh, uh, deeply. Good. So what you have here is that we take three different uh, building blocks. We deposit them, deposit them on, on uh, conductive support. What we are doing, the methods we are doing, we are using is electrochemistry. Um, we make the surface very positive, means that now it will attract the electron. Uh, so osmium, for instance, if this will use as a metal center and deposit them on the surface, we make the surface very positive. Then what will happen, we're taking electron from osmium, it will change to three plus, and then you see that, as I told you, uh, with, uh, they have different colors. And here, 
also by changing the redox, uh, um, um, the, re uh, the redox state, or the oxidation state of the complexes, we can also change the colors, but today I will not talk about colors, and what I will talk about is the electronic properties. So what you see here is a very uh, a basic uh, uh, method we are using as electrochemist, is cyclic voltammetry, I think that uh, most of our chemists to material science are familiar with. Uh, here in the y-axis you have the voltage that we want to elevate, and the y-axis you have the current that we read out. Um, so what you see here is the voltammograms of different building blocks. So we're starting with osmium, and what you see here is that we're starting with the two plus state. Then if we elevate the voltage, it loses one electron and we change to osmium three plus. And here you see this peak. Now if you want to compare osmium to iron and ruthenium, you see that for ruthenium, it's very difficult to take electron. We need more voltage, more energy basically to, uh, to have in order to take, to oxidize ruthenium. And of course it can go vice versa. This is a very reversible system. Now the question is how we can use these building blocks in order to fabricate the functional materials and how we can exploit these properties for our needs. Uh, so uh, last uh, theoretical things that we show you is the, how we can locate them on energy levels. So ruthenium, of course, is the best oxidizer. It, uh, uh, we need more energy to take electron from the homo level to infinite compared to iron and osmium. So I will try to show you today uh, uh, a phenomena we, we observed in our uh, laboratory that help us later on to think about other functional materials. Uh, and is our ability to trap positive charge to make a hole in, in, uh, in, upper, in the upper layer. So again, the difference between the layers is the identity of the metal. So first we have the conductive support, then I'm using ruthenium uh, uh, as a gate, as the first layer, and then on the top I will deposit iron. So this is how it looks like. Okay, so again, cyclic voltammetry, I have both ruthenium and iron on top of each other. We're starting in this point. Now let's try to elevate the voltage, make the substrate very positive. What we, we see is that we get two peaks. It means that there is two population that we manage to take electron from ruthenium and from the iron layers. However, if we now go back to the initial state, what we observe is that we get only single peak, indicates that only one of the layers are being reduced back to ruthenium divalent. Uh, again, in, in, in terms of energy levels, it's very uh, uh, a, a basic that, of course, electron will not, will not go up in energy levels, therefore, the, the positive charge will be trapped on the iron rather than going back to the initial state in which both are going back to the divalent states. So, now the question is, okay, we, can, we managed to, uh, uh, to store a, a, a positive charge on the upper layer, but how we can make this uh, system reversible? In order to do so, we need to think about a, a way to change the properties of ruthenium and use it as a gate. Because ruthenium 3 plus opened the gate for taking electron from the iron. Ruthenium 2 plus means that the gate is closed, the charge is trapped. Now we need to think how to open up the gate and release the iron. And in order to do so, we need to think about a way to take this energy level up and now electron will, uh, will go from the gate to the upper layer and release the charge and uh, um, we're back to the initial state. So we take only ruthenium, we want to characterize it and what we see is something very nice that we can, bo that we can elevate the voltage, we can take electron from ruthenium as I showed you. But now another interesting thing is that if you take the electron to negative values, ruthenium will change to ruthenium monovalent. In this case, ruthenium monovalent is a very good reductive agent that can uh, actually facilitate the uh, electron transfer towards the upper layer. So we can go back and forth. We can uh, track charge, release charge, charging the, the system, discharging the system, and vice versa. Uh, this is the, the setup. The setup we are using is device. Okay, we make a device in our laboratory. It's resembled uh, like a battery. Uh, we, we know we have two terminals. We're using conductive support, um, ITO, indiotene oxide. Uh, in between, we have the molecular assembly of these building blocks. We use a uh, gel electrolyte, and we can play with that very nicely. Um, what, what you see here is when we are basically taking electron, 
uh, from both uh, iron and ruthenium, then go back, close the gate, we take it, giving back only to iron, and then we release the charge, we give back to both iron and ruthenium, and I will end up, I have two, one minute, I will end up, we just tells you that the fact that these two building blocks has uh, have uh, 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 colors, different colors, and are also change the colors upon the oxidation state is really a, uh, uh, help us to understand what is actually happens in our device, I whether it's a, a charge or discharge, okay? Because here what you see is the UVV's uh, 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 spectra. Here you see uh, the absorbance versus the time. So now we're starting with both of them, iron and ruthenium initial state, both divalent. Now we're taking electron from both. We're going up in absorbance because the film become transparent. Then we want to close the gate. You see that we're doing only the half a, a, a way back. We cannot gain back the full color. Means that in this case, the, the device is charged, okay? And now we are releasing the charge and back to the initial state. And we complete a cycle in which we are charging, discharging the device using uh, these building blocks uh, and here you see the, the, actually the color, the initial state, then the, uh, the device is charged, and by changing the properties of this gate, ruthenium, we can go back to the initial state, the initial color. Uh, this is only the tip of, of this project that uh, later on we built up another two functional material that we managed to make out of these molecules uh, using the optical properties of the building blocks and also the electronic properties of them. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Wish you a happy to uh, my <laughs> the, ten, the whole talk with, without, despite the fact that you have the cold. <laughs> and uh, three questions? Yes, in back. Um, so, it's a very nice, very nice presentation. Um, is there a uh, point or reason in trying to build additional layers of just these two uh, metals? And if so, have you tried it to store more alternative uh, yes, layers? Alternative. Yeah, the fact that, okay, the, the thickness, uh, the conductive support is the initial point we need to look at, okay? On the top of it, we are modifying the surf surface by, uh, by adding one layer and the second layer, okay? So now, the surface now is seeing only these two layers. If I will continue to have layer by layer, at certain point, we will lose the connection between the conductive support and the layers we have on top. So that's why it's a, uh, it could be very interesting, but we don't want to lose this, con this uh, interaction between the conductive support and the upper layers. So you would have to add uh, conducting layers in between? Yes. But and the, also, the I, need, I will need to change also the identity of the metals also because we have, a, uh, as your better oxidizer, it needs to be closer to the electrode because then you need to take electrons from the layers that you have on the top, and this is the the the, 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 the this is what you need to play with, the redox potential of the building blocks. Okay. The, you can get. So, so this seems, rather than spin coating, this seems very amenable to 3D printing. Yes, there is a 3D printing spray coating that we're doing in our laboratory, uh, deep coating, many, many, many methods, and also we yeah, have 3D printing. It's also, it can use as a dye. Mm. Uh, yeah. Or actually, I guess not even 3D printing, it's mostly like inkjet printing. A inkjet printing, yeah. Also, uh, I know that in our, in our lab, one of the students is uh, now working on it, uh, developing new methods to extend our toolbox for these uh, building blocks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.